So this is an episode with Dr. Peter Kalmus. He's a climate scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and an activist struggling, like so many of us, with the overwhelming presence of the climate emergency. I wanted to speak with Peter because I found his perspective very informative, but I also think that he is able to speak to a wider audience, which is something that, of course, climate scientists have often difficulties with. The climate emergency is something that I think about a lot, is something that worries me a lot, and it's something that I often find myself unable to do anything about. By the end of this episode, you won't, of course, learn what the solution is to climate change, because for the most part, we already know. We know that we need to significantly reduce our fossil fuel emissions. We know that our food habits and travel habits are harming our living systems. And we know that a lot of the recent hurricanes and fires are caused or worsened by climate change. So this will be the first episode of many to come on the climate emergency. I've titled it Our Climate Emergency Present because I think we need to stop talking about the climate emergency like it's something that's going to happen in the future. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening. As usual, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at Fire These Times. And if you like what I do, please consider supporting this project with only $1 a month on Patreon on buymeacoffee.com. And you can also do so directly on PayPal if you prefer. Patreon is for monthly, PayPal is for one-offs, and Buy Me a Coffee has both options. And if you cannot donate, you can still help by reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. I'm Peter Kalamis. I am a climate scientist uh, and an author. I'm in Los Angeles. Um, I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but I'm definitely speaking on my own behalf here. But that's that's where I am, so it's that's technically true. Um, I um, I'm I'm pretty terrified about climate breakdown. Like, I'm gonna cut, cut to the chase. That's the uh, that's that kind of defines pretty much everything I do now um, is to try to get humanity to take this very seriously and to um, act in a rapid concerted way. So I, I think my belief is that, you know, I, I'm trying to do everything as I can, everything I can to, to get um, systems change to kind of, you know, to, to empower this climate grassroots climate movement so that policymakers are forced to implement um, aggressive policies that create meaningful change that we can see in the global emissions curve. We need that emissions curve to go down. I think to get that emissions curve to go down quickly, we need a very, very powerful grassroots movement. So that's why I'm also an activist. So it's this um, sort of uh, tension between being a scientist and the cultural norms around being a scientist are to not rock the boat and to sound calm and to only talk about scientific facts not to talk about how those facts make you feel but those scientific facts make me feel terrified and i've got two kids and i am um, my you know my parent instincts have kicked in big time and so i am um, i'm compelled i don't have a choice i'm compelled to speak out like this uh, and to try to raise the alarm you know i i used to be called alarmist i, I think it's getting harder and harder for um, the people who, for whatever reason, don't want us to take action on climate change. And there's a lot of them, uh, but it's getting harder for them now, I think, to, to, uh, to pigeonhole me as an alarmist uh, because more people are getting alarmed because this, you know, what we're seeing with the mega fires and the hurricanes and the flooding and the storms and sea level rise and heat waves, it's it's very if you're if if you're paying attention at all, or if you're experiencing that firsthand, either one, it's it's very alarming. So that's basically who I am. Yeah, well, it's one of it's one of the reasons why I contacted you, obviously, and it's I appreciate you doing that uh, through your Twitter account and also through your work off Twitter, obviously. Um, I I know about your book, Being the Change. Can we talk a bit about it? About like the motivation behind writing it and uh, what what would be if someone gets it for example what would they expect from the book so we talk about the general uh theme sure yeah so it came out in 2017 uh around the 2010 um i i you know i i've had this has been a long journey kind of toward being like a really a fire breathing 
climate activist and, and, and knowing how to, you know, I've, I've been concerned since 2006, you know, and I've seen this as an emergency since then, but it's been, a, the, what's been long about the journey is how to be effective as an activist and how to, um, how to express what I'm really feeling, right? Um, and to not message and not to try to make assumptions about what people are going to resonate with, but just kind of find this authentic voice where I'm just saying what I truly believe or what I'm truly feeling as a human, um, which is why my, my Twitter account is called Climate Human, for example. But in you know, 2010, between 2010 and 2012, that was a period where um, I was increasingly seeing the very direct connection between burning fossil fuel and climate catastrophe. And, you know, we, we weren't at that point, things were quite amazingly less intense than they are now. I mean, it's amazing how these, the, the, these eight years between 2012 and today, the change in fires and storms and other impacts that we're seeing now, it's remarkable how much, to, in my opinion, how much things have changed just in eight yeah. years. But I wasn't, I wasn't quite freaking out as hard. It still felt a little bit more like it was in the future back then. Now it feels like it's very much in the present. But the climate of present is what I, back then I was thinking maybe we'd start to experience in like around mid-century. So I think my visceral sense of where we were heading in 2012 was about, I'm ashamed to say, like maybe 30 years too slow. You know, and I knew the scientific projections, but I didn't know how it would feel like this living through these mega fires in Southern California right now. And, um, and, and, you know, feeling empathizing with the Australians who lived through the mega fires in Eastern Australia, you know, last winter for them. So about six months ago, um, it's just remarkable how, how fast it's going. Uh, but back then, you know, I was making this connection between fossil fuels and it started to feel worse and worse to me personally to burn fossil fuels. So it's, I, I, it's tricky because when I say like I live on a tenth of fossil fuels, there's so much confusion over that simple statement. So people will assume that I'm virtue signaling and, and I'm not really. I just, it feels disgusting to me to burn the fossil fuels. So it's a deeply personal thing. Um, people will assume that that's the way to be a climate activist by reducing their own fossil fuel use. And what I found was that... Um, if that's your attitude, if you, if you know, I started out kind of with that attitude, like, oh, like I, I don't want my emissions to go into the atmosphere. If everyone kind of kept their emissions out of the atmosphere, we could solve this problem. And that I quickly realized that's totally the wrong approach to doing any of this, to, to reducing your own emissions, because you quickly realize how small that action is. It's just not big enough. It's not going to get us where we need to go fast enough. So, um, so the reason I do it is because you know, it feels disgusting to me to burn it. And then also because um, to make those changes, uh, to start biking more and driving less, um, to start flying less and spending more time in your community, to start gardening, gardening more and eating the food and the fruit, the vegetables that you grow yourself was, uh, and, and to compost, um, you know, and to go from being a meat eater to being vegetarian to being vegan and feeling better about, you know, not, not causing the animal suffering and feeling like healthier because of doing that. All of these things and many, many others, I, I kind of had this epiphany as I was finding ways and it was like a game, you know, to, to understand where my own emissions were coming from and to find ways to reduce them. And I actually enjoyed it. Uh, and I didn't see anyone saying that. I, I saw everyone saying like, you have to do this, but it's a horrible grind and it's going to be a sacrifice. And that wasn't my experience. So that was the immediate thing that made me want to write a book was to, 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 to put that message out there that by living in a kind of climate responsible way, it wasn't a sacrifice. It was actually, you got more exercise, you felt happier, you had more community. And there are a lot of good reasons to do it, even apart from keeping your carbon out of the atmosphere. You know, and at the same time, I just switched from astrophysics to earth science. And so I was reading a lot of papers. I was understanding the carbon cycle, which is pretty complicated. And I wanted to get this big overview of the science kind of for myself. And, and I'm like, why don't I put that in a book? So, so I, it also has a pretty clear, concise overview of the science, which, does, which isn't afraid to get into some of the complexities. And maybe I made it a little too complex. But I was, it was my own process of kind of discovering the you know, as a climate scientist, you focus in on a very tiny piece of the Earth system. Like, you might study one particular kind of clouds, or you might study how drought works in one particular region. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, I think it's also important to spend some time 
you know, if you're, if you're not studying the Greenland ice sheet, you should still know something about how that's happening and you should know something about how sea level rise works. Um, and then there was one other component too, which I started to realize that, uh, you know, this is something that affects anyone who's a human on this planet or even anyone who's not a human on this planet, any being on this planet is currently being affected by climate and ecological breakdown. And um, how to respond to that when you're one mammal walking around on this planet, interacting with other mammals, um, being part of the society, how do you respond to this global, this overwhelming global problem in a way that makes any amount of sense, right? That's like, to me, that was a million dollar question. And I'm like, I have to try to grapple with that. And, and I want to explore what that means spiritually, actually. Uh, and, and those were kind of the three um, pieces together that kind of made me, impelled me to write this book, you know. And, and I guess there's a fourth thing too, which is I realized that if I kind of put these thoughts down, first of all, I would understand all of this better myself because it forces you to think, to actually write things. It makes you, forces you to think about them at a much deeper level um, and think about how what you're saying could be misinterpreted and how maybe what you're saying could be wrong in certain ways. So you have to think about um, all the implications and how to defend what you're saying. So it forces you to, to go into places uh, in terms of your thinking that you wouldn't have gone into. And then I also realized that I wanted to sound the alarm as loudly as I could. So I had to build some kind of platform. And you know, I thought having the book would be useful for that. And also, you know, if you're doing something on Twitter, you're writing a little tweet, you only have a very few amount of characters and so you can, as someone, you know, so someone else is always going to say, well, what about this? And you're like, well, you know, I wanted to tweet about this one thing, but you could go read my book here. I do talk about that other thing here. So that's useful. So that's what made me write it. Uh, it's very interesting because I've had a similar path in the past uh, decade or so. I did my undergrad studies in environmental health, um, which is basically the intersection of environmental sciences and public health. And I then stopped. So I did my master's in cultural studies and now I'm doing a PhD in philosophy. And what I'm trying to do essentially in the, my plan for the next couple of years, three years is A, well, finish the PhD obviously, but also actually transition myself towards a more environmental uh, science one way or another. I haven't exactly decided what yet. And this comes from as well, in the past few years, I would say, especially in the past three years, I've become increasingly, um, well, I guess aware is the world, but also very terrified. I have gotten to the point where um, I also do things that one should do basically at this point. And it, so for example, I, I, I've been a vegetarian for 15 years and then I, I became a vegan about last year. Um, I do avoid planes as much as I can. Uh, I even took a train from Scotland to Geneva, and including some bus, bus trips. And that when I used to do that in the past, so like let's say three or four years ago, I would actually feel like I had to justify myself. I had to explain that I'm not just being kooky and weird and uh, this is just my thing and whatnot, but actually that I genuinely feel that this is what should be done. And of course, one person taking the train instead of taking the plane doesn't make that much of a difference. But then I, I feel like the action of taking that train in, in this particular example was also more about than people around me ask me about it. And then we talk about this. It yeah. was also the conversation was part of it. I would say having this podcast is probably more impactful than anything you can do to reduce your own emissions, for example. So this is just one good example. But this is still something you can choose to do. And then, you know, the more you realize this is an emergency, I think more, naturally, the more you want to just start using less fossil fuel yourself. And I think it does help shift the culture. So let's be very clear. There's a lot of um, activists who correctly say that individual action, so individual efforts to reduce emissions, not gonna solve this problem. They're 100% correct about that. We need systems change at a big scale. But let's take a step back and think about how we get that systems change. So we've known about this happening. And the scientists have known for decades, governments have known for decades, fossil fuel corporations have known since the 1960s and 70s, right? There's been, for half a century, the governments of the world have known just 
what's going to happen if we keep burning fossil fuels. There's been zero action. So there's been nothing coming from top down. So if we, if we, if we continue expecting for this kind of systems change that we all agree that we need to come from the top down, for like the elected officials right now, the government leaders right now, to actually do the right thing and implement meaningful policies, sweeping policies that very rapidly, within, I'm talking within 10 years, we need no more fossil fuel industry. We've got to globally get rid of all fossil fuels in 10 years. That's where I'm at. We've, it's, it's been two years since the IPCC put out the special report that kind of was, was kind of mapping out the carbon budget very clearly. And um, unfortunately, th this was a very unfortunate message, was that, you know, we need to get to uh, net zero emissions by 2050, right? That's not the correct message. Uh, there's two problems with that. One is 2050 and one is net zero. Those are both fatal flaws in that deadline because they both allow policymakers today to not do anything. So anyway, the system as it is, it's very, we've had decades of experience knowing that we will not get the systems change from the top down. So then there's only one other choice, which is from the bottom up. We need a we need a billion climate activists, we need a very strong grassroots movement, and anything, and that means all of us as individuals make up this movement. So anything we do, whether it's having a podcast, flying less and talking about that a lot, you know, talking to your crazy uncle who's a climate denier and getting them to change, going and giving a talk at your public library, uh, joining an Extinction Rebellion and getting arrested by, you know, chaining yourself in front of a, a an oil refinery. Whatever it is, we need all of that and more. All right. So no one should be discouraged if they're doing something which is aligned toward getting away from fossil fuels and toward a carbon free civilization. That should be encouraged. So, so flying less, we should recognize that that's not enough. But we should also recognize that giving a talk at your library is not enough. We should also recognize that even getting arrested through direct action is not enough, but we need all of this. And together, and it's demoralizing, right? If there's only a thousand activists working on this, we're sunk. But if there's a billion of us working on this together, we'll be okay. And we'll, we'll lose a lot. Things are gonna suck. We're gonna continue having mega fires and smoke and hurricanes will continue to get stronger. You know, we will have to abandon, we have, we'll have to abandon many of the low-lying areas of this planet where a lot of people live. It's going to be brutal, but we can we can get through this as a civilization. I still believe if we if we come together that quickly and we realize that this industry, the fossil fuel industry, is literally killing us, and you know we can't allow that to continue to happen. Um, so any yeah you know any I can't tell anyone how to be a climate activist. Um, everyone has to figure that out for themselves. That's how you can be. The most powerful and if, if you find your authentic voice and find out how you explore how you can make uh, as big of a difference as quickly as you possibly can um, and and that's going to look and feel different for different activists um, but we can join together we can talk about this we can um, recognize uh, certain principles um, about how to talk and how to act that can maybe make things go faster so we don't as activists we don't have to reinvent the wheel from scratch every time but i do think we have to find our own unique voice and our niche with, within this movement and above all just to, to keep waking people up and and causing people to realize at a, at a deeper emotional level that this is a life or death emergency that's to me that's the bottom line um because that's what you know I, I, things are burning down and things are melting all over the planet right now and we're not even willing um, collectively to give up commercial aviation, for example, right? So that I, I hammer on aviation a lot because to me it's so deeply symbolic. Um, if w once we give that up, once we say we can't fly anymore, it's just too damaging, or we can we we have to fly way less, or we can we can let like field scientists do their research because they have to understand how you know this part of the planet's changing. So we have to let them go do that. But you know we can't fly for pleasure anymore. We have to do our business over Zoom and virtual reality now. Uh, we can't have fly in academic conferences anymore because this is too serious. This is too big of an emergency. Once we finally do that, I think it will unlock uh, so much emergency actions in other ways. But while we're still flying around, it's this very strong, to me, message uh, that we can continue business as usual 
that we can somehow have our cake and eat, our, eat it too. It's very aligned with this idea of net zero by 2050 and that carbon offsets make sense still. I think carbon offsets are a scam. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still kind of going along while our planet's burning and melting around us, acting like we can keep having this business as usual. So I'm not against travel. Um, I'm not even against flying. I think flying is amazing. But I just think that um, we, we have to collectively realize that this is, this is such a big emergency that we shouldn't be subsidizing fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry anymore. And that maybe we, sh we should accept that we, we can't just keep living as we've always been living. Because living that way is, is let's be honest, there's these systems that we live in that, that cause us to, you know, that bring the, the meat to our table and that allow us to fly around and that make all of those actions normalized, right? So it's not, it's not an individual thing to be living in this way, but it's th these systems. But we have to recognize that those systems are what have gotten us into this predicament. And so those systems have to change. And there's gonna, we will experience a difference in how we live our lives as those systems change. For example, I don't think we'll be able to just hop on a plane and go to Tahiti for the weekend anymore. I don't think that doing that, it's a hard thing to say. And I know um, there's a lot of people right now probably listening who aren't, um, who aren't there yet. I think more people will get there over the years. I think, uh, you know, 10 years from now, um, I, I hope, by then, it'll be accepted that, um, yeah, we, we probably waited too long before we actually really started treating this like an emergency and um, kind of going all in on, you know, and, and that, that unwillingness to give up any amount of our fossil fuel privilege. I mean, I'm not even talking about not flying, really. I'm talking about flying less, right? That's the first step. Um, and doing all these other things and, and also being an activist in many other ways and, you know, suing the fossil fuel corporation and suing our governments and, you know, um, uh, taking over uh, the offices of policymakers and, you know, um, all of that other stuff. We, we need that as well. Um, but, but I just feel like symbolically it's so important to accept that we this is such an emergency that we ha also have to start living with less energy as, as a species collectively. We are energy hogs I and mean, we have this basically free source of energy and fossil fuels that's effectively free. And, uh, and it makes, makes a lot of sense that we, uh, that it became the foundation of our entire economy and um, the, the entire way that the richest, you know, people on this planet live in, Europe and the United States and Australia, right? Um, you know, it's, it's important to realize that there's a lot of climate justice um, aspects to flying too, right? Only the global rich fly. So, so yeah, I don't know. I, it feels weird to keep hammering on that because I know it's not a solution, but I see it as just something so symbolic uh, and um, as in a way, a, a leverage point for trying to unlock the systems change that we all know we need and it's, a, it's not that's not a message that plays very well on twitter because i think it's a little bit too subtle but it's it's still what i believe well speaking of twitter um th so I, there was a twitter thread that you posted in which you went into two basic concepts trend and irreversibility sorry i can't pronounce that can so part of the, so i'll ask you to expand on those a bit and Part of the reason why I would ask that is I do think, I mean, a part of the problem, and I think the evidence bears that out, is we also need to learn how to speak about what we're dealing with in using even different languages, using new words. Uh, some of the concepts that I didn't really understand until fairly recently are stuff like climate anxiety and climate grief, for example. There is shifting baseline, there is trend, there is irreversibility, all of, all of those terms. Um, if we equip ourselves with a new vocabulary as well, or not necessarily new, but at least equipped for uh, different purposes, I feel like it allows people to comprehend the scale of what we're dealing with a bit better. Because I, I, I don't think for the most part where anyone who's not a climate scientist would be able to comprehend it at 100%. Even climate scientists, of course, can never get to 100%. It's more a matter of getting there a bit more, which... Uh, I'm hoping anyway, would at least make the, the urgency more, more palatable. Yeah, these are two very basic concepts that I kind of sensed that 
maybe a lot of people still didn't really kind of fully appreciate. Um, and you know, I have a, you know, there's this tension that I have between kind of knowing you know, a lot about this, these issues and um, at the same time knowing how much I don't know. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's probably, I, I suspect that's shared by a lot of scientists. Um, you know, it's, a, it's important as a scientist to know what you don't know. But anyway, um, these are two. These are two things that that are very clear to me, and and hopefully by talking about them, I can make them a little bit clear to the public. And I think they're they're two of the best reasons to see this as a life or death emergency. Um, okay, so trend just means that we're like on an escalator into hotter temperatures. Um, so we're we're still emitting globally as a species uh, greenhouse gases approximately exponentially with a doubling time of roughly 30 years, which is remarkable. So what this means is um, half of the, the carbon dioxide our species has emitted has occurred since 1990. Um, that's just the, the, the mathematics of exponential growth. So what this means is with, um, as long as we keep doing that with 100% confidence, we can say that the planet's going to continue getting warmer and warmer and warmer. It has no choice. Um, it's just basic climate physics, which is extremely, extremely well understood um, of, you know, the, the, the heat trapping nature of, uh, of, of greenhouse gases um, and energy balance and black body radiation. Uh, these, this, these are physics that have been known since at least, you know, the mid 19th century. Um, some of the details of uh, radiative absorption wasn't fully understood until uh, midway through the 20th century, because that's quantum mechanics. But but now we understand very well how you know how greenhouse gases absorb uh, infrared radiation and re-emit it and cause the planet to get warmer. All right. So as long as we keep emitting those things and they keep accumulating in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a very very long time, uh, some of it some of what we emit will stay up there for thousands of years. Um, so it keeps building up in the atmosphere and the planet keeps getting hotter. And so that means that all of the stuff that is being driven by that accumulation of carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels um, at an exponentially accelerating rate, all of those impacts will keep getting worse. So the megafires will keep getting worse. The droughts will keep getting worse. The storms and the massive rainfalls and the flooding will keep getting worse. The sea level rise will keep getting worse. Um, the ice sheets and the Arctic ice and the, the glaciers in our mountains and the snowpack will continue to melt um, just as it has been, but it'll, it'll all, all this stuff will keep going and get worse. Uh, the strain on our agriculture and our water systems will get worse. Climate migrants will continue to get worse because it will continue getting hotter in the tropics and it'll be, be harder and harder for them to grow food. At some point, um, it'll be harder for their bodies to maintain uh, a livable 98.6 degrees because it'll be too hot and humid. So their sweat will stop working. So they'll continue um, leaving their homes and giving up everything and trying to move into other countries. And then those other countries will keep responding and, and people will be afraid that um, they're running out of resources and they'll be afraid that, that all of these people are trying to get into their country. So they'll put up walls. Um, so all of these dynamics I, I fear will continue getting worse. And that's what I mean by trend. We're, we're not in something new now. We're, we're in a process of everything getting worse. Um, and, and it's gonna get worse until we stop, until we stop burning fossil fuels, until the entire fossil fuel industry is dead, to, to not mince words about it, right? Um, which is disturbing because the fossil fuel industry enjoys massive subsidies. They, they lobby our policymakers. They enjoy massive political influence right now. They, they write laws that, you know, and, and they fight legally to prevent their demise um, and to continue making profit off of burning these fossil fuels. So they're very powerful and they need to go away completely very, very quickly um, in order to stop that trend. So is that clear? That's what I mean by trend. Uh, irreversibility yeah. is kind of the other side of the coin. Um, what that basically means is I don't believe we can just, uh, you know, people talk about just sucking the carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere and make it sound very easy. Uh, I think it would be so hard as to probably be impossible. 
it would be um, extraordinarily expensive to do that. It would take a massive amount of infrastructure. Uh, it's a generational crime because we're, we're basically saying, it's, it's just, if we say that you know, net zero, we can suck this carbon out of the atmosphere and you know, we have to get there by 2050, it's basically an excuse to keep emitting now and then to saddle our, uh, the young people of today with that huge burden uh, of figuring out the technology, which we, we don't really know how to do that, uh, and then building that up at scale and, and devoting a huge fraction of their economies to do that, while they're also devoting a huge fraction of their economies to dealing with abandoning you know, Miami and, and um, you know, you know, the insurance company, uh, the insurance industry collapsing and, you know, strains to the food system and so forth. So it's, it's um, it seems very irresponsible to put that on our young people. So irreversibility then um, means that the stuff that we're at now, the, the global heating, you know, we're at one point, between one and 1 1.2 degrees Celsius of average global temperature increase right now. Um, that's going to be with us, that global heating. I, I think since, you know, unless we fit, do figure out a way to suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, or unless we take the radical step of geoengineering to cool the planet, that global heat's going to be with us for hundreds of years. Uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere is going to be with us for thousands of years. And that's going to, you know, not only is that driving the heat, but it's um, you're causing the, the oceans to be uh, more acidic and it's causing our crops to have less protein, for example. So there's other effects just besides the heating to this, this kind of really radical change uh, to the atmosphere that we've caused. Um, and then, you know, so, so now we're out to, you know, kind of a thousand year time, sc time scale and the United, St United States has only existed for a couple hundred years. So to put that into perspective. Um, and then, you know, we're also seeing ecosystems collapse um, and biodiversity be uh, dramatically reduced, possibly faster than, uh, you, you know, it's, a, it's another mass extinction, right? And, and it's happening very fast. I, I suppose the uh, meteor that, that basically did in the dinosaurs was even faster. But, you know, from the geological point of view, making these changes in a few decades is effectively the same uh, as, as a meteor, right, from, from the biosphere's point of view. There's not, there's not time to adapt and evolve to, to changes that are happening this fast, uh, very easily. Um, and that biodiversity uh, degradation will take millions of years to recover. Um, so that's what I mean by irreversibility. It's not, this is not like a polluted river that we can clean up. Um, it's not like a park where we can go and pick up the garbage. Uh, these are Found, you know, fundamental changes in how our earth system works. These are, you know, forests, rainforests turning into grasslands and uh, ice sheets that have been on continents for um, thousands of years melting and going into the, you know, the ocean and coastlines being changed for thousands of years, right? That the whole map's going to look different of the world. Um, so that's what I mean by irreversibility. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very different than other kinds of pollution because of that irre irreversibility. And it means that um, you know, deci decisions that we're making uh, now, today, over the next few years are, are profoundly impactful, uh, again, in ways that I'm not sure everyone fully appreciates. I would ask you, so there is this amazing quote, uh, I just wrote down, it was from some video you, you appeared in or something, I don't remember, but you, you mentioned how like uh, gardening should be right up there with reading, writing and arithmetic in our schools, a basic oh, yeah. literacy. Yeah, that was in my book, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, to sort of wrap it up by going back to the initial point, essentially, about the actual importance of change. And uh, with that, you know, you already uh, added all of the disclaimers by saying that, you know, one person doing this obviously isn't enough and so on and so forth. But let us assume that uh, a million people do this or a hundred million people do this or whatnot. What are some of those changes that you can see as very feasible? Or well, not even, may not forget feasible. I mean, at, at some point we need to start doing things that may seem unfeasible right now. But what are some of these things that when you go and talk or give these public lectures or even you talk to your kids or other people, what are some of those things that you actually focus on? 
yeah, so there's, um, we as individuals, we can, we can respond to this. Uh, there's, there's two kind of places that are areas of response that I think are important for us as, as individuals. One is doing stuff that makes us happier and that, um, you know, makes us more effective and helps us from being burnt out um, and lets us keep going um, as activists uh, kind of through these uh, challenging times. Um, and the other one is being a lever for, for systems change. So we're all like, you can think of us as little pry bars pushing on this giant system and moving it a little bit. And then if we all push at the same time in the same way, we can, we can make massive change. So, um, so again, we won't, we, it's just, to me, it's very clear that we need systems to change. We need, the, we need for example, um, the fossil fuel industry to be nationalized uh, you know, in different nations. We need maybe fossil fuel rationing. People aren't ready to talk about that yet, but I think pretty soon we will be talking about that. We need to ban um, all new fossil fuel infrastructure and the exploration for new fossil fuel. We have to end subsidies. Um, you know, California just announced that by 2035, you won't be able to buy a, a vehicle that's not electric here in California anymore, which is, which is a good, again, that, that's not nearly enough. But like flying, that's, I think that was very, a very important statement symbolically because that's the kind of big picture kind of thinking. It feels a little radical, right? We won't allow automakers to sell gas cars in our state. That sounds radical, but it's not. Like if you look at the, how big the problem is, that's a very, very tiny piece of it. But it's important because it's, it, it takes us away from this complete silence. Like we, we've had presidential debates in the U.S. where they don't even talk about climate change. We have stories in the media about heat waves that don't even mention climate change. So, so even that small thing of, of only electric vehicles uh, by 2035 is, is huge. Um, now, you know, uh, so as individuals, what, what can we do? Well, if it makes you feel better to have a garden, like it makes me feel better to have a garden, uh, and I think it, it builds community and it, it makes our communities more resilient. Um, and it connects us to the earth and it changes how we think about this pale blue dot. It makes us feel gratitude for what this earth provides. I mean, this earth, uh, everything we have, um, our bodies, our babies, uh, our food, our water, the air that we breathe, the friends that we talk to, the technology that we use, all of this stuff literally comes from the earth and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this planet. So we need to start feeling gratitude. To me, um, you know, gardening is uh, composting. That's a great way to do it. I, I know that's not going to directly solve this problem, but, it, but it's, it's something that makes me feel better. So it's in that category. And then I think it allows me to kind of, it gives me this perspective of, of, connection and the earth and reminds me what I'm fighting for, which helps me be a more effective activist in the second sphere, which is being a lever for systems change. And you can do that by having these kinds of conversations, by talking to reporters, by speaking at your public library, um, by doing art and music that, that fi directly faces the climate emergency. Um, by uh, getting involved in direct action and you know joining Extinction Rebellion and joining the Sunrise Movement in the United States, and there should be Sunrise Movements starting in other countries that force policymakers, um, you know, they get involved in the messy business of politics and uh, try to get uh, climate candidates elected and try to destroy the careers of climate deniers that might still be in office, right? So um, we need to start. We need to change all of these systems which evolve. Uh, in, a plant, uh, in a civilization that was addicted to fossil fuels and um, was taking Earth's climate and the other sort of life-giving uh, uh, services that the Earth, you know, th these life support systems that, that you know, ca you can't even put it into words, right? It's not something that can be monetized. It's, it's everything. It's, it's our entire existence here. Realizing that, I think, um, kind of is, for me at least, it's what um, powers my activism. Uh, so those two things are very connected. Um, but, but yeah, we, we can't lose sight of the fact for sure that we need, we need systems change and we need policies, but we just have to be very clear on how that happens and, and realize that um, we can be profoundly impactful as individuals in order to make that happen.
On that note, uh, thank you a lot for taking the time to talk to me. Uh, this has been really, really informative and, and uh, all encompassing in just over half an hour. So I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for doing what you're doing, Joy. Pe keep speaking out and uh, waking people up, okay? Thank you.